thanks Andre for the <laughs> thanks Andre for the nice introduction. Um, and yeah, welcome to the Friday afternoon seminar. Um, and yeah, today it's about mass atometry, and um, I think I will uh, start to introduce mass atometry, the technology, a little bit. Uh, what we do um, uh, in our lab to, 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 to help a better data quality uh, and then also um, show some examples from uh, what we are doing basically uh, using mass atometry. So um, it is clear, I, I think I don't have to emphasize this, that uh, cells are very uh, diverse uh, and, and this is just like a tree, a nice tree uh, illustration of, uh, of, 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 of the human uh, uh, cells that can emerge from uh, from from uh, stem cells, uh, and of course uh, uh, there's there's corresponding phenotypes to all uh, of these uh, subsets, um, uh, which you can further superimpose with with uh, certain cell properties such as uh, like cell signaling, uh, uh, homing uh, receptors or homing receptor expression uh, markers that reflect uh, cellular activation, uh, the cell functionality like the cytokines and in, uh, in, in, in T cells and other cells. Uh, cells co uh, cell communications, uh, uh, like by adhesion, but also over distance and differentiation. All these, uh, for all these uh, features uh, and biological functions, or for most of these, uh, we, we have some markers at hand. Uh, and of course, if you think in a, in a system, uh, in terms of a system, there's not only the cells of the human body, but also uh, like the, your symbionts, yeah, like the microbiota, uh, and not only the cells per se, but what matters also uh, when we start yeah, looking at the cells systematically is uh, wh where they are located. Are they located close to each other, away from each other in different organs, uh, and of course time dimensions. So this is all very complex, uh, and uh, still we have to emphasize each cell is unique. So like if you think of uh, cancer, yeah, cancer arises uh, usually from, from one event in a, in a single cell, or also like autoimmunity, uh, where autoreactive clones of T or B cells like also emerge. Uh, from one uh, single precursor. And um, this is to illustrate that it's not only about single cells, but this is kind of a fractal where you see the, uh, where, where, uh, the, the singularity of events uh, like uh, precedes uh, through not only the, the, at the level of cells, but also populations. Uh, and finally, these are organized in, in cell systems or organs. Um, and, and these yeah, are composed in human beings. Uh, including uh, patients, and so this is not only a diversity of cells, but in the end also a diversity of, of, of patients. And this is what we, uh, where we actually want to make a point using uh, omics technologies uh, to analyze patients and to, uh, to, to help um, uh, understanding uh, what goes wrong in the patients and, and how uh, these patients uh, actually differ from each other. Because heterogeneity, not only of cells, but also heterogeneity of patients is a major obstacle in the treatment uh, for chronic inflammatory diseases. Uh, I think it is very clear, but maybe has to be kept in mind. Uh, since if all patients were the same, we only need one drug. Uh, and they would all respond or not respond to a single treatment. So uh, what, uh, what have people done so far uh, for using um, uh, single cells uh, in, in, in terms of cytometry, so measuring yeah, the cell size and measuring the cell equipment with receptors, uh, is using flow cytometry, uh, which I don't have to introduce so much because it's a very established technology, uh, also with uh, known uh, limitations, uh, that is, it can only uh, measure a limited number of channels and uh, uh, yeah, uh, th there's a problem of fluorescence spillover, of course, um, and uh, so mass cytometry evolved uh, uh, about five years ago, five to six years ago, um, and was uh, developed at, at a spin-off in, in the University of Toronto. And then I think uh, I like to see this as propagated maybe, or uh, brought to blossom in, uh, at, at Stanford University. And the principle of mass cytometry is not to use uh, the, the classical fluorescent uh, proteins uh, that we use to conjugate to antibodies, uh, and, and an optical detection system, uh, but uh, instead of this, to conjugate um, antibodies or other probes uh, with heavy metal isotopes, uh, which are strongly enriched, uh, so that basically each single antibody carries uh, uh, or is attached to a specific uh, uh, isotope mass. Um, and uh, by combining this with a, with a ICPMS, with a mass spectrometric uh, readout, which is commonly used uh, for, for trace metal analysis, uh, uh, People developing mass cytometry uh, around uh, Scott Tanner 
uh, have been successful in uh, creating a way of cytometry that can measure uh, uh, many, many more uh, analytes uh, than uh, flow cytometry can. Um, and, uh, a system, uh, and the system has at the same time the advantage uh, that it does not know autofluorescence. Uh, so, so certain effects that are very like, limiting in flow cytometry are not applied or uh, yeah, do not apply to mass cytometry. Um, uh, and there's also a little, sometimes no, sometimes a little bit uh, of, of overlap or signal overlap between uh, the, the uh, different detection channels in mass cytometry. So the technology basically starts, uh, as I said, with antibodies, uh, which are isotope labeled. Um, and uh, these uh, you use, like in a flow cytometry assay, to, to incubate your cell population uh, or your, your cell suspension, your sample, patient samples with, uh, with a series of different antibodies. Um, uh, th these um, are then uh, introduced into uh, the machine by a small glass device called nebulizer that basically creates an aerosol uh, where uh, the droplets then contain ideally one uh, single cell per droplet. And this uh, aerosol is passed into the machine, into the uh, mass cytometer, yeah, um, where they pass an argon plasma. At, at this point, basically all the biological matter is uh, is, is, is completely uh, destroyed, uh, and what, what remains is an ion cloud. And this ion cloud uh, is filtered for yeah, irrelevant isotopes, yeah, for all the uh, biological uh, or the, for, for, the, for the cellular um, uh, matter like uh, carbon and uh, nitrogen. Um, and what remains uh, then is a, uh, is a cloud of just uh, the heavy metal ions, which come only from the, uh, from the antibody tags uh, that have been used in the assay. Uh, and these are separated by a time of flight uh, device. Um, and finally, uh, you can record, or the machine records mass spectra, yeah? and does so uh, uh, about 80,000 times per second. So in a very, very um, uh, uh, narrow um, uh, and, and, and fast way. Um, and, and by this means, uh, you, you can um, assign uh, multiple spectra to each cell uh, that, uh, that is being measured. Um, and uh, your your signals in the different uh, uh, in the in the different masses correspond uh, to the metals that you use to label the cell, um, and you can uh, basically have an expression profile for each single cell uh, that you measured. Um, inherent to the technology is not only the novel uh, way of generating the data, but also entailed uh, novel ways to look at the data. Uh, so uh, computational uh, means are very important uh, when it comes to dealing and analyzing and, and interpreting this data. Of course, it's easy to imagine that if you, if you have more markers, yeah, uh, so we are currently using in our essay uh, close to 50 markers, uh, not counting any accessory uh, labels for barcoding or like that uh, discrimination or so, uh, that, that it becomes very, very uh, quickly unfeasible to, to analyze all these dimensions uh, or all these dot plots in a way that we used to do, or also I used to do in my PhD thesis. Uh, and you get to a quadrillion phenotypes uh, resolution if you consider 50 channels with each having a bimodal distribution, which is a, uh, a huge number and uh, funnily uh, exceeds uh, the, the approximated number of the cells in the human body. Uh, so one can of course uh, wonder uh, how this relates to each other, and, uh, but uh, this is just to illustrate that the resolution capacity of the platform uh, is really enormous. Um, I have to emphasize that this is still a single cell technology, so we can get uh, lots of data from, from single cells. Uh, it's a protein detection uh, method, so we are not, uh, well, there, there are some probes also for detecting RNA or transcripts. Um, uh, the majority of projects deals with protein detection, yeah? and it's suitable for almost any cell type, uh, which is, let's say, not too large. Um, I think I have yeah, made clear already that the, the, the advantages of the, um, of the platform, uh, that the signal spillover is really minimal and controllable and predictable, uh, which I will come back to uh, that later. Uh, it's, it's very high dimensional, so we can get lots of information from single cells. Uh, it's not light or time sensitive like flow cytometry and it has minimal background because the reporter metals that we do, uh, that we use, the lanthanides, uh, they are almost absent from biological uh, material like cells. Uh, the drawbacks are also like significant, uh, at least for some projects. Yeah, there's no physical recovery of the cells because they're just burned. Uh, we, and we have um, a limited cell transmission efficiency. So we, uh, we compared to flow cytometry, we lose uh, somewhat more cells during the processing uh, of the cells. 
um, and the data acquisition rate is still uh, limited. So we have to carefully plan how to um, how to design a mass cytometry experiment um, uh, in order to to make it uh, yeah successful and, and economical, of course. And there is an analogy to to forward or sideward scatter. Um, so we have to make sure that all the um, cells that we want to see by mass cytometry uh, are actually labeled with at least uh, a minimum amount of metal. Yeah, the, the, important, the most important law of all uh, uh, assays in, in, in biological labs also applies to mass cytometry. Um, and so we, um, uh, yeah, we dealt a lot with uh, generating uh, tools and, and helping the data quality of, uh, of mass cytometry. Uh, and if you think of the normal routine, uh, uh, yeah, set up of an experiment, yeah, you collect data, you analyze data, you get results. Uh, this may become a little bit more complex for, for mass cytometry. So there's a couple of things that also apply to different assays, but uh, are especially of interest here in mass cytometry uh, to, to, to make uh, data very, very uh, consistent uh, is to yeah, keep in mind standardized uh, instrument setup uh, and uh, reagent uh, quality control, sample barcoding to minimize technical error, uh, stabilization of antibody cocktails, something which has not been achieved, uh, which has been used and is being used in flow cytometry, but has not uh, has not been able or has not been uh, used in mass cytometry yet. So we uh, have found a solution here, uh, and also the use of reference beads and uh, cell samples for tracking the performance of uh, uh, of mass cytometry uh, experiments and studies. On the on the side of data analysis, of course, there are several steps. Uh, that may uh, that are uh, somewhat more uh, um, um, where we spend more time on, yeah, as compared to other methods, is the data curation. Curation, of course, uh, then we need means and algorithms to break down the dimensionality to make this accessible for yeah for human brains and uh, for human eyes, also in terms of visualization. Um, and finally, also dealing with data repositories, uploading data, making it accessible to others is quite. Uh, can be quite uh, uh, can mean quite a lot of work, and so uh, yeah. Finally, we figured out after having solutions for uh, many of those things uh, that sample quality uh, or the, the 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 quality of cells actually, especially if we store them uh, in freezers or so, is is a significant uh, source of error, um, and uh, so we we also work on that topic. So when you think. Uh, this is really scaring, uh, you might be right, uh, but if you team up with experts, I think uh, there can be quick ways to also deal uh, with, with mass cytometry uh, in a very competent way, and so, uh, yeah, look for your co-facility and uh, central labs. So, uh, I want to go to, uh, to, uh, through some of the um, uh, technologies or, or tools that we have been developing, yeah, so, uh, historically, I started with uh, preparing uh, cell surface barcoding. Barcoding means that you uh, barcode each uh, sim single sample um, and uh, by a specific label, uh, be it a, yeah, so it has to be a metal in our case. Um, and uh, by this means, uh, each, each sample is, is specifically and uh, reproducibly tagged. And then you can pull this and you do all the steps uh, that you do for, for sample preparation, staining, washing, fixation, etc., etc. Uh, you can do uh, basically on the you can perform on the pooled uh, sample, and by this uh, you can guarantee that all the cells uh, are undergoing exactly the same procedure. Uh, and this also applies to the measurement. Uh, so you inject into the machine uh, the pooled uh, sample, uh, and by this means, um, uh, yeah, there, there cannot be difference between uh, the samples anymore that arise from technical error. So you cannot you, you can be rather sure that the that the differences that you see. If you finally deconvolute uh, the sample data or the data of each sample uh, electronically, that the differences you see are uh, due to biology, um, and that this really also make, makes a big difference is maybe exemplified here. So these are 20, 20 samples uh, that are like measured one by one by mass cytometry, uh, and if you do this the same, take the same samples in a barcoded manner uh, and run the same assay, it looks much more consistent, and this also also greatly helps. Uh, bioinformatic evaluation of the of the data as, as you have uh, way less more uh, uh, amount of noise. So there's different ways to barcode the cells. Yeah, you can. Um, this is a traditional or the first uh, published method to to do this basically after permeabilization, um, uh, which has a drawback that you cannot uh, stain anymore for certain fixation sensitive epitopes and markers. 
uh, there has been kind of a, 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 a progress made uh, with a partial, so-called partial permanization. I still don't know what that means, uh, but uh, it's just a mild uh, permanization, yeah? Uh, and we introduced uh, surface barcoding using CD45 antibodies, uh, which is still, uh, I would say, a hit in the scene. Um, and yeah, it is very clear that uh, this, this, this helps the data quality a lot. Um, since there are many cell types or some cell types like, uh, like plasma cells or also tumor cells or so, not all of them express CD45, so we uh, looked also at other, um, at, um, at, at other molecules uh, that could be suitable for barcoding. Oops. Um, and uh, among these are uh, like HLA, ABC and beta-2 microglobulin, uh, two very abundantly expressed uh, uh, cell surface receptors, uh, which are not only uh, uh, expressed by, by lymphocytes and monocytes, uh, but also by neutrophils, um, like it is uh, the case for CD298. Um, but of course, there's yeah, there's no like one, there's not one option that fits for all. Yeah, so uh, th this molecule gives very bright staining uh, and is very suitable for barcoding most cells. Uh, while we, we see some uh, yeah, caveat in analyzing NK cells in, in, uh, in this case, for instance. Yeah. Um, so in order to develop uh, a barcoding that is not interfering with a, with a core analytical window where the lanthanides are measured, so this is where the information actually comes from in mass cytometry assays, we, uh, we kept on developing uh, new antibody conjugates, so we established uh, a conjugation of uh, antibodies with palladium, uh, giving us uh, six additional channels, which we mainly use for barcoding. We also develop platinum uh, labeling of antibodies with four additional channels. Um, and uh, Axel Schulz in our lab, uh, he uh, set out to, to develop a more sensitive assay, um, because sometimes sensitivity is limiting for certain, for certain markers. So he used uh, 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 silver nanoparticles uh, of, of different sizes, uh, to amplify uh, the signal detection or the, the detection of uh, CD25, a uh, very popular marker for, for regulatory T cells, uh, uh, and this is to show that it actually yeah, helps a lot uh, in detecting this cell type. Um, and uh, not only this, but also uh, we, uh, we found that the expression of CD25 on B cells, which is already described in the literature, but which you cannot see using this uh, staining, but you can see it uh, using. Uh, or with the help of these silver nanoparticles. Um, one, one thing I touched already is the stability of antibody cocktails. So there's lyophilized versions, uh, especially for large uh, studies, uh, for multicenter studies, uh, for available already for flow cytometry. These are also like, you can buy these from different vendors. Um, uh, but you can imagine that if you do uh, mass cytometry, A, we have not this option yet, yeah, and B, um, uh, if, you, if you prepare all the time the same antibody cocktail uh, with, with 40 or more than 40 antibodies, uh, this, is, this is kind of prone to, to errors, yeah? Um, and so we, uh, and, and, and this is an experiment uh, which I performed at Stanford, where I took a small antibody cocktail of just 10 markers or so and uh, placed them at different temperatures. Um, in order to address the actual stability of these antibody cocktails, um, and I found that all at all temperatures, I don't get back any meaningful uh, uh, staining patterns after uh, uh, after one month, yeah, after four weeks. Um, only at minus 80 degrees and in like liquid nitrogen, so at very very deep temperature, we have been able to uh, to recover uh, nice nice stainings here for for monocytes and B cells. Um, and we, we followed this up and uh, did a lot of uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, validation studies of, of to, to follow up this idea of using deep temperature to preserve antibody cocktails. Uh, and this has been very successful. Uh, so this is one of the last uh, examples where we did uh, uh, used a more than 40 parameter immune phenotyping panel uh, uh, and uh, froze it down uh, for yeah, up, to, up to 19 weeks. Um, and uh, we were still able to maintain, using the same PBMC sample, uh, the, the exact composition of the cell uh, without much change. Um, and uh, yeah, since then we are yeah, using this uh, uh, small trick, basically, uh, but it's very helpful and it's also very popular uh, in, the, in, the, in the field of mass cytometry. So, um, a very recent project uh, dealt with uh, the application of beads, uh, and because beads uh, and flow cytometry are very important. Yeah? Beads are used for, uh, for, for controlling the instrument performance, uh, they are used for 
uh, also um, uh, quantification for counting, for yeah, cell counting, for as a reference in many, many regards. Uh, and so we wondered, uh, or we thought it would be a nice thing to have uh, uh, beads or the same capability of, uh, of beads also in mass atometry. Um, but we figured, and uh, people have used beads before, uh, including us, uh, but it was never, yeah, uh, it was never very satisfying because uh, you, you needed really uh, a, a very high uh, signal intensity of any of some metal on, on, the, on the beads in order to, to properly see them. Uh, and so, uh, a very uh, talented master student in, in our lab, Lisa Butzinski, uh, she uh, took the challenge to, uh, to, to make this happen for mass atometry. Yeah? And the idea was here to use osmium tetroxide, um, uh, a, a, a highly reactive compound, uh, to label uh, polystyrene beads. Uh, and it's known that it reacts to plastic, so this was basically the, the rationale for doing this. Um, and uh, we were quite lucky because uh, this went quite well. Yeah? So it's very easy basically to achieve uh, osmium labeling uh, of, of polystyrene beads uh, with osmium. Um, and so this is a bead uh, when, it's, when it's not labeled to osmium, and uh, this is an osmium labeled bead in osmium channel. Osmium is not used in any other mass atometry, uh, uh, yeah, or it's not, not used for any other analytes or so. Um, and it also does not have any background. So this is a plot uh, which you see when you run the site off. Uh, you have here uh, the beads identified by the osmium uh, signals, and here like uh, there's a, uh, an antibody conjugate captured by this uh, antibody capture bead. Uh, bead yeah, uh, you can store these uh, beads also for a while uh, without uh, too much uh, too much uh, uh, variation in the osmium signal, um, and um, yeah, and, and the labeling with osmium is also concentration dependent. So you have a very very well controllable system uh, here for for generating such beads. Um, and, and this is here for perhaps to illustrate the problem, because if you don't use the osmium on your beads, uh, the beads look like that. So this is the event length, um, and there's a certain natural cutoff for, the, for, the, um, uh, for, for, for mass atometric uh, measurements. Yeah? So you cannot go below, below this. And this, uh, this red line, the dotted line, is the standard setting. So, so this means actually cells and any matter that you dissect by site of has to be in that area, so above the red line. Yeah, so you can play a trick, and you can uh, basically lower the detection limit here. Yeah, um, and the event length that just corresponds to the number of spectra that you analyze. And if you have, uh, if if your if your beats are only like labeled very, uh, not at all, or just with with few metal, uh, then you see that it looks like this. Uh, that the basically the the bead population is cut off, and you selectively only. <coughs> Uh, see the beads uh, that are very brightly labeled with uh, with the dye, uh, and so this of course leads to to not capturing all the subsets. So we have here a detection <laughs> of, of only about one fifth of the uh, of the actual beads uh, that we inject um, when not using osmium. Yeah, but when you use osmium, you get all the beads uh, and you get the precise and correct uh, signal intensities uh, that you would like to read out. And this kind of beads, uh, they have many um, applications. Yeah, one of them is. Uh, in the uh, for you, uh, one of them is for using them for uh, creating uh, bead libraries for compensating mass atometry data. So there was a paper last year uh, from from uh, the Bodenmiller group on how to correct for for the small signal spillover, even for the small signal spillover that you see sometimes in mass atometry data arising from isotopic impurities, uh, for instance. Um, and here this uh, um, this nicely shows that the spillover. Uh, that you see uh, uh, from resulting from uh, isotopic impurity of indium-113 uh, can be corrected using uh, the, the, the proposed uh, compensation algorithm uh, using uh, the, uh, the beads uh, labeled pre-labeled with osmium here. A second application that we explored is basically to, to rebuild a quantification assay for receptor density uh, on uh, that is popular in flow cytometry, uh, but here to do it for mass cytometry, because once you have an extremely complex uh, antibody uh, staining of, of, of cells, you can uh, here use, uh, make use of Cytov to not only compare maybe two populations of uh, cells of interest, but uh, basically hundreds of uh, populations of cells at the same time. Um, and so we, you basically prepare uh, capture beads uh, that have different numbers of capture sites, and you give, we give them a label. Uh, or gradual, uh, gradual labeling with osmium tetroxide uh, so that we can detect them uh, besides each other in a mixture. Um, and by this means, 
yeah, we, we have been able to quantify uh, CD4 receptor density uh, on, uh, on, on, uh, on different PBMC subsets, on different cell subsets from, from, from the blood uh, of health, healthy individuals, but also of lupus patients. And uh, it's here just coined autoimmune donor, but basically it's lupus patients. And we figured out uh, that there's a significant difference uh, in, in the CD4 density uh, between healthy individuals and lupus patients. So in terms of application of the, um, of the technology in our project, uh, we, uh, we, we, we started uh, different immune monitoring and immune phenotyping uh, approaches. Uh, one, is, uh, one of the like, drivers of this is um, uh, the, the, the project that is embedded in the, in the Leibniz campus. Um, and this is dealing with uh, different uh, patient cohorts from different disciplines and served clinically by different disciplines uh, where we have the idea, okay, if people uh, do have the same kind of pathogenically defined uh, immune signature in the blood and we know that in, in one disease uh, there, is a, there is a drug approved for treating these and there is a clear uh, uh, immune signature for, uh, for uh, response to this treatment, uh, we could kind of uh, uh, yeah, transfer this therapy of concept, uh, this, uh, this uh, therapy concept to, to different patients in different disciplines uh, which show the same signature but for, for whom the, the therapy is actually not approached, uh, not, 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 uh, uh, not approved. And so we, yeah, we collaborate with almost everyone <laughs> um, uh, in order to, to make this happen. Uh, and we have, uh, yeah, we, we developed, or Marie Ulbricht is driving this project, yeah, she's a PhD student in in Andreas and in, in, uh, in my lab, and uh, she uh, not only yeah, approached this, uh, this uh, idea, but also combined it with the idea to use the activation of intralar signals, uh, signaling uh, pathways uh, as biomarkers, because mm -hmm. phenotypes, as surface defined phenotypes, might not, uh, might not appropriately uh, reflect <coughs> the actual uh, activation of, of cells. And so, by this means, we hope to integrate also cytokine and antigen receptor activation uh, that happens in the patient. Yeah? And for this, uh, Marie set up a, um, a, a pipeline that is based on the smart tube fixation system, uh, which allows to very quickly uh, and ultimately uh, fix uh, the, the, the state of a certain blood sample uh, within just 15 minutes. Um, uh, and, and by this means also to preserve uh, the intracellular signaling uh, signature, yeah, uh, and so she integrated this into a pathway of uh, like a yeah sample prep for mass cytometry, um, and uh, using uh, a few lupus patients, uh, she could uh, already demonstrate that there are uh, there, there are certain uh, deviations in lupus uh, regarding the um, uh, the phosphorylation of STAT3. So this is ex vivo data. There's no in vitro stimulation whatsoever, um, and there's a, uh, there, there's increased uh, phosphostat three. Um, expression or active, uh, start three activation in, in the T cells of lupus patients um, uh, and also in the monocytes. And uh, yeah, this, this system has also become very yeah, popular and uh, we also collaborated with Shutuna Vecha. Uh, her project was to basically analyze uh, human microglia and uh, these had to be shipped from the Netherlands and also in this, uh, in, in, uh, yeah, in, in, in this endeavor, in this major endeavor, uh, uh, the, the, the system or this fixation system uh, was of great utility. Sabine Baumgart also uses the same system basically for uh, collaborating with a group in Kiel uh, who, are, who is interested in, in uh, inflammatory bowel diseases and so she developed a, a, a more than 40 marker panel uh, to, to capture um, uh, the cellular diversity uh, and to, to basically look for biomarkers in these IBD patients and this included very active <coughs> Crohn's disease but also uh, 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 colitis ulcerosa patients um, uh, and this is also based on the smart tube system so the, the samples have been banked at Kiel, uh, in Kiel and then they were shipped here and we could uh, just directly make use of them. Um, and uh, it's very interesting and there's another uh, example that I will show later uh, that there are some, some shared and some non-shared features uh, that, that, uh, between the two diseases. Yeah? So there's an increase in plasma cells uh, that is evident in both uh, 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 populations. There's decreased B cells. It's basically a little bit like, uh, it's reminding me of lupus basically uh, in, this uh, in this terms. And, uh, but there's also uh, specific or, uh, features that are specific to Crohn's diseases and uh, colitis ulcerosa. And uh, th this is now like work that is uh, in the making and uh, is being uh, 
uh, um, yeah, analyzed and uh, deeper analyzed and uh, will hopefully be published soon. Um, finally, uh, this is a, a project that we run here. Uh, it's on rheumatoid arthritis patients, uh, where we used all the utilities and all the to good tools that we uh, have shown you before um, uh, to, to analyze basically or to, to have an immunological state uh, description of rheumatoid arthritis uh, and also the, with the idea to, um, uh, to perhaps identify subgroups within the disease. Um, and uh, here we have been, uh, here been able to identify different clusters of cells uh, using uh, flow sam clustering. Uh, among PBMCs, so, so these are cryopreserved PBMCs, and we can uh, identify here all the major subsets, yeah, uh, B cells, CD4 cells, CD8 cells, monocytes, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, FlowSum has been used to, to create uh, about different, uh, 60 different clusters, yeah. And when we now compare statistically uh, rheumatoid arthritis and healthy individuals, um, uh, we see that uh, many uh, many lymphocytic uh, subsets are basically uh, decreased or like have a lower frequency uh, in rheumatoid arthritis except, uh, or not except, but not the lymphocytic subsets, but the classical monocytes uh, basically balance for this. Yeah, So we have a, a, an overarching signature of lymphopenia in certain but not in all uh, lymphocyte subsets, yeah, uh, because it's just, just uh, certain clusters here that, uh, that appear to be reduced. Um, and what, what I cannot show you today, but we also uh, used uh, uh, convolutional neural networks and uh, uh, also a citrus algorithm, which also does uh, computational uh, evaluation of, uh, of, of clustered data. Um, it came out that basically one receptor or the, 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 the populations share the expression of one receptor, which is uh, CXCR3, uh, uh, an old equipment uh, basically in, in rheumatology. Uh, which is uh, sought to, to drive uh, the, the, the immigration of um, uh, lymphocytes and other cells into, into uh, to sites of inflammation. Yeah. Um, we have realized that this is maybe not sufficient for uh, really uh, getting or for analyzing the, uh, the cell subset that, that we have uh, spent lots of markers in the panel. Um, and so we, we pre-gated now uh, different cell subsets like the T cells here. Uh, and uh, again, we can identify all the major uh, subsets by, by eye, basically. Um, and again, having this comparison here, and in this study, we also uh, we, we in included some uh, multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, we see here that uh, some, some signatures, again, or some, uh, some, some effects, some features uh, are true for both uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients and multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, so where, where we see a decrease or an increase uh, in a particular cell subset frequency, uh, but not all, yeah? There's also like this uh, uh, effector memory subset uh, where we have uh, basically opposite effects uh, in rheumatoid arthritis and uh, uh, multiple sclerosis. At the same time, one has to note that uh, th there's also a big uh, diversity across uh, the patients, yeah? So some of these uh, uh, multiple sclerosis patients, they do very well match uh, the state, if you want, so of RA, yeah? While some others uh, definitely don't. Uh, and I think uh, this also underlines the uh, yeah, the concept uh, that, that, that we have chosen to, to approach uh, the, the precision medicine uh, in, 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 in chronic inflammation um, uh, and, and to, to stratify patient cohorts based on cellular signatures. We also explore now uh, B cells and basically in the same uh, data set and uh, this is, has, has become a very nice analysis uh, uh, which is very fresh and so we, we have not like in detail uh, looked at this uh, but we can see basically all the uh, familiar subsets, but including also the very rare and uh, in autoimmunity interesting CDLFC, uh, CD11C positive B cells, uh, uh, CD1C ex uh, C expression for marginal zone-like B cells, uh, IgA uh, expressing cells co-overlapping with CCR10, uh, a mucosal chemokine receptor, so this all fits very well. And uh, also here we identified some mostly memory uh, B cell populations uh, that are uh, altered in, in rheumatoid arthritis and uh, yeah, we currently keep on analyzing this data. So uh, that, that's a summary slide, uh, there's lots of black and white, uh, so I hope I could show you that mass cytometry is a well-established technology uh, now that is available for high-dimensional immune cell profiling and chronic inflammation. Um, and uh, I introduced you to different tools uh, that we developed uh, and which are very popular to, to, to increase and improve uh, the, the quality of mass cytometry data and to make them basically perfect for bioinformatics to work on. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I gave you some first insights on how uh, how we use mice cytometry in, in, in clinical and translational research. Uh, I didn't talk about B cells and plasma cells so much today. Um, yeah, and uh, I thank you for your attention and of course all the people who did this work. Uh, so, uh, Axel Schulz and Sabine Baumgart, uh, Marie Ulrich, Tyler Burns uh, by, uh, helped a lot with bioinformatics, Lisa Budzinski worked on the uh, on the beats, uh, and of course, uh, uh, yeah, all collaborators, uh, internal and external. And you, I thank you for your attention.